Hello, and welcome to our web training of our new fifth grade STEM storyline called Save Our Turtles. This is a life science storyline, and it is created to support the Living Systems FOS kit that um, teachers in our STEM Material Center co-op here at ESD 112 receive. So this is a fifth grade storyline, and um, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Pranjali Upadhyay, and I am the Integrated Curriculum Coordinator here at ESD 112. So my job is creating content, which is curriculum, professional development, other resources for teachers to use, and also programs that support equitable STEM learning for students here in Southwest Washington. The intentions behind this web training today are for you to feel very ready and excited to teach our new fifth grade STEM storyline. I promise you will find it pretty interesting and pretty fun, and I hope your students will feel the same way. So here I've pasted two links for you. The first one is a link to our slideshow that I'm using as a part of this web training. And the second link is to our website where you can actually download a copy of the unit to follow along as we move along um, in this training. So I would recommend that you go ahead and pull up the slideshow because we will have some links in there that you can check out. And also I would recommend that you log on to stemmaterials.org and download the full curricular unit. And that way you can actually follow along and you can familiarize yourself with the different materials within the unit and kind of start thinking about how you're going to use and adapt these materials with your own students. I always like to give a little disclaimer at the beginning of any STEM storyline training. Um, a lot of times we're expecting something similar to a FOSS training, which is just a kind of like a walkthrough of the hands-on materials that are used in various labs. Uh, this isn't a FOSS training. This is going to focus more around the actual curricular unit. So a lot of the pedagogical um, and instructional protocols and different activities and discussions that are going to play a very important role in your students' high quality learning of STEM. So just a little disclaimer, this is not a FOSS training. Um, and we will cover a lot of curriculum also in a short period of time. So please feel free to pause and digest or pause and take a deeper, deeper look at things um, if you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed. I wanted to share a couple more things with you. As you may know or may not know, our ESD 112 kits in grades K through five are no longer going to include critters. So I will put a link in here for you to check out um, some of the reasoning behind that shift um, in addition to some resources. So this STEM storyline that I'm training you on today does not actually include any critters. So they've been intentionally omitted from the STEM storyline, but we've really worked hard to create a fun and engaging experience so that the critters will not really be missed a whole lot. And there will be some pretty great field STEM or STEM outdoors sessions that I will share with you. And also just a whole lot of other relevant and exciting activities and ideas for students to engage with. So just wanted to preface with that. Um, so we have written the critters out of this storyline just for your ease. Also, there are a lot of opportunities for overlap between STEM and English language arts. And I will be pointing those out to you throughout this training. But um, I hope that you'll feel like there will be an opportunity for you to really help students practice a lot of their uh, reading, writing, speaking, listening skills throughout this integrated unit. Lastly, I wanted to point out that this unit is inspired by the framework of project-based learning. So it will look a little different from um, more traditional ways of teaching science, and there will be a lot of opportunities for student voice and student choice throughout the unit, which I think is very exciting and very important to create an equitable and empowering experience for our students. So I uh, just wanted to preface with those few notes for you.
with that, we can go ahead and get started. But actually, before we get started, I wanted to point you to the unit overview in the actual curricular unit. In this uh, unit, it is located on pages three through six. So here you'll find an overview of the different sessions within each lesson. Um, there's links there to resources such as handouts and websites that you will need throughout the the unit and also we have hyperlinked page numbers in there just to make it easy for you to access different parts of the unit without having to scroll up and down because it can be pretty lengthy. With that we're going to go ahead and get started on lesson one disappearing turtles session one. So this is what we call the entry event of this unit. Uh, entry events are super important in PBL because they are the way that we actually engage and excite our students about what they're going to be learning about. So an entry event can be really fun and exciting and get students very hyped up about the project, or an entry event can be kind of dull and disengaging. So we want to avoid disengaging and we want to really try to create an experience where students are excited about what they're going to be learning. So I hope that you're going to be excited. Thank you. I'd like us to go ahead and jump in by watching this video. So this video is located on slide eight of our slideshow and I've pasted that link in there to our slideshow again in case you haven't pulled that up yet. So please pull up the slideshow and slide eight. Go ahead and watch this video for me and then we will move on forward. So you can go ahead and pause this and watch the video for me. Thank you for taking a few minutes to watch that video. And now what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to think to yourself for a few moments and to write down your thoughts about the following questions. What are some things that you notice about the video that I just sh showed you? What are some things that you wonder? And then what are some things that you know? So notice are things that you you found out about, uh, things that you wonder, questions that you have, wondering, things that spark your curiosity. And then the things that you know, those are things that you, you already have in your arsenal of knowledge that you have in your brain. And there are things that you connected to when you saw this video. So the way that I usually do this protocol in a classroom, when students are there in person is that each student writes each thought on one post-it. So if they have three wonderings, they take three separate post-its to write their wonderings. Um, if they have three noticings, they, they take three different post-its and write each noticing on a separate post-it. So I'm going to go ahead and give you a, a couple minutes to write down what, what things you noticed, what things you wondered, and what things you know and then I will show you what to do with that next. So thank you for taking a couple minutes to write down your thoughts. And here is the very important driving question of our unit. We will be trying to figure this out. This is gonna be the question that's going to guide our learning and our investigating and our thinking throughout the unit, which is, how can we as Washingtonians help preserve the Western pond turtle populations living in the Washington state? So what I would probably also do is to give students a couple more minutes to write down any other noticing or noticings, wonderings, or knowings that came up after the driving question was brought up. And now is probably one of my favorite protocols that I've done in the classroom, and it's called the scientist circle. So the way that this is implemented when you are with students in the same physical space is students create a, a circle around three charts. So you have one chart that says, notice, one that says wonder, and then one that says no. And um, students start by sharing their noticings. So you have one student start by sharing something they noticed. They have it written on a post-it, so it's easy for them to share that. Then they hand it over to you. You take that post-it, slap it onto that chart, and then you elicit more students' ideas that either connect with what the student brought up or an idea that's a different idea that's also a noticing. And what you'll notice is that after students have shared what they notice, they will naturally kind of start moving into things that they wonder. And then I usually save things that we know at the very, very end. Um, so 
it's a space for each of your students to have a voice and a contribution at the very beginning of the unit. So we're not waiting weeks and weeks before all of our students' voices have been heard. First day, they're able to share. Um, and it's important to give them that, that time in the beginning so that they have something to share. And then with a lot of the shy students, sometimes they'll have a noticing or wondering or a knowing that's similar to another student's. So they can kind of piggyback off of that one student's idea saying, oh, hey, my idea was similar to yours. And um, you're still validating their thinking and um, giving their voice value in the classroom. So this is a very important protocol. And I would really um, emphasize the point that each student should be sharing something in this scientist circle, regardless of their um, diverse needs. They need to all be sharing. Um, that's a very important part of the scientist circle. And um, there are also ways that this has been implemented in a blended or virtual learning space. And um, there's ways to use Padlet or Google Docs to create a space online where students can actually share their thoughts instead of um, facilitating this type of a protocol in person. So uh, try to think of creative ways where you can use this. There's definitely more than one way to do a notice, wonder, no scientist circle. Um, and there's definitely ways to adapt it to your specific needs. So I would just continue by showing students more images of the Western Pond Turtle. At this point, this is the entry event of our unit. So we're really trying to get them invested in the cause of saving this super adorable turtle. So that's kind of one of the reasons that we very intentionally picked a creature that is absolutely adorable because students really want to help them. So here's some pictures. I'm gonna let you kind of look through those and then I'll meet you back in, in a couple seconds. So again, we're back at our driving question, which is, the guiding umbrella question of the entire unit. So the students are going to be using this idea of preserving the western pond turtle populations as a drive to actually understand more deeply about ecosystems and the different interactions within ecosystems and then also the different threats that humans pose to ecosystems in a variety of ways. So we're covering the life science standards for fifth grade for NGSS, and we're also covering some standards on human impact. So um, it's a pretty exciting bundle in my opinion, and I hope that you'll feel the same way. So since the driving question is the most important question, guiding question of the unit, it's really crucial that students understand the different pieces of the question. So in this specific driving question, we use the word preserve. Um, it's not given that your fifth graders or all of your fifth graders will understand what that word preserve means. So I would pause to actually discuss what does it mean to preserve something? What does it mean um, when we say we want to preserve the Western pond turtle populations? So driving questions are great, but we also need to keep in mind that they need to be student friendly. And if there's language in there that you think students might not understand, it's important to take a sidestep to really talk through with the different words within that driving question actually mean. So this is still continuing the entry event. We're getting students hyped up about the Western Pond Turtle. And then we are letting them know we're going to be answering our driving question. And we're also going to find a way to share our learning with a public audience. So you're going to be creating something that will be shared outside the walls of the classroom. So that's a really important facet of project-based learning is that students' voices have impact in their community. Students' voices have impact outside the walls of the classroom. And it just is a greater motivating factor for students to learn and create something that is truly a reflection of their best effort if they know that what they're creating is not only going to be seen by you or their classmates, but also by people outside the classroom and in the community. So um, very important to launch the unit in this way. So we're just continuing on the 
idea that students' voices have power and students' brains have power and that they're influential members of their community. So I like to show students this. It's called the You Matter Manifesto. And I would share this with them at the very beginning of the unit. Um, not all students have been given this message. So it's a great opportunity to remind them that they are enough and that they matter and that they have a voice that is powerful. They have a perspective that is unique and important and that they have the ability to create po positive change in their community and in the world. So um, definitely would share this with them. And so we're kind of wrapping up that first session at the beginning of the unit, launching this unit, getting students invested so that we will be able to sustain inquiry, sustain excitement for the remainder of the actual unit uh, because everything's going to tie together with the Western Pond Turtle and that driving question. So now that we've launched our unit, we're going to continue to session two on lesson one. And students will be creating a model of the Western Pond Turtle and its habitat in this session. Um, it's really important to elicit students' initial ideas at the begin beginning of the unit. And that way, um, students will be able to see how they've grown and how they've deepened their understanding of concepts as they progress throughout the unit. So you can think of this as kind of like an initial assessment of sorts. I forgot to mention, if you're following along in the actual unit guide, in the actual curriculum guide, we're currently on page nine. Um, this is lesson one, session two, where students are creating a model. So we would just remind them of the driving question and about the Western Pond Turtle and um, just kind of uh, have them recap what they remember. And now that students really know what they're doing, they really know that they're trying to help the Western Pond Turtle, um, what I like to do is I like to pause and add to that list of wonderings that were um, compiled on the first day. So what are more things that students need to know before they can solve the problem? What are more things that we really need to know before we can help the Western Pond Turtle? So by having students ask a lot of questions at the beginning of a unit, you're giving their voice actual value. You are um, helping them to understand that their inquiry, that their questions and wonderings are actually the driving force of the unit. So um, even though to some degree we are expecting certain questions from students and our instruction is somewhat planned out, um, we still want to validate their questions and um, having them generate questions gives them just a greater buy-in in the learning in general. So pause to ask more questions or to give them the opportunity to ask more questions um, that they are going to try to answer throughout the unit. So students will likely mention that they need to understand more about the Western Pond Turtle and the reasons why it's facing a threat for survival. So I would reinforce that idea. You're going to notice throughout the unit that we have these little spotlights called career connections. So this is an important initiative that we've taken on the past several years. And what we're trying to do is to create windows where students are able to see what a STEM professional in the field actually does and how it relates with the skills and the content that they're learning as junior scientists. So here's a snapshot of what a con conservation ecologist does. And um, honestly, in the unit, they're going to be doing a lot of work that really mirrors what a conservation ecologist would do out in the field. So the idea is that we, at a starting a very early age, are trying to plant this idea that they can actually, so our students can actually pursue any of these careers that they desire to and that there's so many interesting careers out there in the STEM field and in other fields as well and that they are worthy of and capable of being successful in these careers. So um, here's a conservation ecologist. I would um, share that with students.
So now we go ahead and have students create a scientific model to show what they think is happening. So um, here you notice I didn't write to show what they think is happening, but to show what's happening. So um, there might be a misconception that your students have that a scientific model or a model is something that is three dimensional. A lot of teachers also have that misconception when we say the word model that we're talking about a diorama or some type of three dimensional object that represents something in nature. However, in this case, and in many cases in our STEM storylines, a model is simply a diagram or a picture that explains or tries to make sense of something that's happening in nature. So this is our attempt at sense-making of a phenomenon that we are observing in nature. In this case, the Western pond turtle and its you know, um, struggle for survival. That's the phenomenon we're looking at. And um, we are going to have students actually create a picture explaining what they think is happening. Now, um, this is their initial model. So this is something that is going to help us understand their preconceptions about how ecosystems work and just the complexities of this specific issue. So their scientific models at this point are supposed to be incredibly flawed. And, and that is okay because they will continue to refine and develop this model to the point where it will be a very legitimate and awesome um, representation of what's going on by the end of the unit. So um, please be very encouraging there during this time. And also um, it's suggested that you allow them to work in groups for the majority of this unit. So uh, group work or teamwork rather is um, an important part of project-based learning. And um, you know your students best and you know the number of uh, students that would work best together in a group. And um, you know you know best how to, how to uh, pair them up with students that they're going to be successful with. Um, that actually varies a lot depending on on the classroom and specific groups of students but um, i would consider groups of three um, i've heard that for fifth graders that tends to work pretty well um, of course it may be different in your case but that would be kind of like my baseline recommendation is to pair them up into into groups of three so again here's a little checklist of what your students models should include and we're trying to emphasize to them that this is an initial model and that they're going to have a lot of time to improve it and that mistakes are a good thing at this point so we're trying to really develop um, that growth mindset in them by really intentionally um, you know crafting our tasks to promote the growth mindset because we often talk about the growth mindset in classrooms but our Sometimes the way that we reinforce or present ideas are quite contrary to, you know, promoting the growth mindset. So here's um, my attempt at it. And in project-based learning, um, time management is an important skill that we're having uh, students develop. So I've made a checklist here for you. So it's important to talk through with students what that means and that this is actually a checklist for them to kind of look through and self-regulate if they're actually completing the task properly. I also have a timer in there for you in the corner in case you needed um, that type of a thing to help them keep in track. I always like to use timers, it, it's very helpful. Um, and then also, this is something that I would give them a large piece of paper to work on. So, um, I mean, ideal would be something that's half the size of a chart paper at least. Um, something uh, larger than the eight and a half by 11 would be great. Um, if you give them something very small, there is a chance that they're gonna have to redo it. If you give them something a little bit larger, there's a chance that they can actually just iterate or improve that model through the course of the unit instead of having to redo that because there would be too much going on in a little piece of paper. So it's up to you how you do this. I'd try to give them something a little bit on the larger side versus smaller. So next, students do a gallery walk where they tape up their models around the classroom and they take a look at their brilliant ideas and just share their thoughts with other teams and start thinking about ideas on how they want to help the turtles. So we want them to start developing some, um, some thoughts about what interests them when it comes to that Western pond turtle. How do they think they want to try to help them? We're now going to move on to sessions three and four in lesson one, located on page 10 and 11. 
Session three is an outdoor STEM activity, which is a part of all of our STEM storylines. And in this specific STEM activity, students go outside and identify the living and non-living things that they see in the schoolyard. So we're starting to get students to look around in their local ecosystem and make sense of the different organisms that live there and also the different non-living things that are in that ecosystem that are in, that are an important part of it. So you can go ahead and take a look at page 10 for the guidelines for that uh, outdoor STEM investigation. We usually refer to these um, outdoor STEM experiences as field STEM, but you know, you can call them different things. Um, if you would like, you can have students create a field notebook where they will continuously keep all their outdoor observations in, or you can just, you know, have a piece of paper and something hard to write on that they can just take outside to make their observations and drawings and um, to try to illustrate their ideas and what they see outside. In session four, which is located on page 11 of our unit, students will read more deeply about the Western Pond Turtle. So the way that we do this is we divide students into different groups and each group will read a specific or research a specific topic about the Western Pond Turtle. And then they're going to teach half the class about their topic. So the way you're gonna separate this out is by splitting the class up into two groups. And then within each half of the class, you're going to split up further into four groups. So we have four topics that will be covered. And the um, at the end of the research and um, investigating about that specific topic, each group is going to share with their half of the class about the topic that they researched. So we're just trying to get them to understand more of who is the Western Pond Turtle? Like, what is their um, what is their presence in the, in the Pacific Northwest? What are their habits? What are what is their diet? What are their behaviors? Um, what habitat do they live in? What do they what do they need to survive? So um, it's really important for them to understand that in order to actually save or preserve the Western Pond Turtle. So um, I've given. Uh, a couple of articles uh, that I've linked to in the slideshow, but in the actual unit, those aren't going to be linked there. Um, you can have students, depending on their comfort level and depending on their um, previous previously developed skills on researching, you could let them loose and have them research on their topic um, on the web or the two articles that are that I've attached in the slideshow are an optional resource that they can start with um, as they try to become experts on that specific topic that you've assigned to them. So in this session and in the following sessions, the sessions four and five, students are in groups, they're researching the specific topic, they're trying to come up with some type of material, whether it's a poster or some slides to share that information with the rest of their peers. And we're making the career connection with teacher or professor. So students are actually learning material and finding a way to understand the material and share that information with other students in a way that's interesting and understandable. So um, STEM professions are important. Um, other professions are also very important, but I thought it would be really crucial to highlight the fact that teaching is a very um, crucial and challenging profession and that they're actually practicing some of the skills to be a teacher or professor within this unit. So as a PBL person, I love giving students a lot of voice and choice in what they do, but I also understand that in the elementary grades especially, it's really important for them to have structure. So in this specific activity where they're teaching another part of the class, I would share a checklist with them. So they have to read the article, collect information, and find a way to present that information to the class. And then the following session is where they present in their seminars or Western Pond Turtle seminars. Um, so again, voice and choice is wonderful, uh, depending on the type of teacher you are. Structure can also be helpful, even in the project-based learning space. So um, giving students choice does not have to necessarily conflict with there being structure and expectations. So um, having checklists is one way 
but I like to um, kind of make those expectations clear with the students and also give them some structure on how to work during that team time that they have. Students will now present their information to their half of the class. And then I would usually, um, I would urge them to go in this order just because you're starting from basic and kind of moving into details about the Western Pond Turtle. And then um, please congratulate them on their first like mini practice presenting to another audience type of an experience in this unit. There's going to be there are going to be some other um, places within the unit that they're going to be practicing their ability to communicate ideas to other people. So again, strong ELA connection here, um, being able to read texts, informational texts to understand them, to um, pull information, important information from them, and to be able to summarize and communicate that information in a meaningful way. That's the direct use of important skills in literacy. So after the seminars are done, students will have most likely learned a lot from each other from these seminars. And it's important to revisit that scientific model that students have started um, at the very beginning of the unit and to give them an opportunity to make revisions to this model. So this model is gonna serve as a really, really helpful tool to see how students have been learning and how their, their thinking and their ideas have been deepening and how their understanding of the Western Pond Turtle and its predicament has been becoming more clear over the span of the unit. So um, please do give them time to revisit that scientific model. That should be a formative assessment that is very alive. It should be something that really changes as the unit progresses and becomes cooler and cooler and cooler as students um, start to grasp material more deeply. Lesson two starts on page 14 of our curriculum guide. And this is a longer lesson where students are investigating what the Western Pond Turtle actually needs in order to survive. So we start by looking again at the Western Pond Turtle, and then we look really closely at what the producers in that ecosystem or the plants in that ecosystem need in order to survive. So students are building an understanding of ecosystem dynamics and the fact that, um, yes, we have omnivores and yes, we have herbivores, but at the end of the day, a lot of that energy from that um, within that ecosystem needs to come from plants and plants get their energy from the sun. So we're um, having them uncover the interconnectedness of the different organisms within the ecosystem. Um, so this is where the bulk of the FOSS investigations are going to be housed. So the different investigations where they're looking at plant growth and studying plant growth, they're gonna be located within this lesson. Now, again, um, I told you at the beginning of the training that there, we're not emphasizing um, this as a training for the FOSS materials. Um, as you can see, hopefully by now, uh, scientific learning and high quality STEM learning, it's about more than the hands-on investigations. It's about connecting what the students are doing with their hands with actually what's going on outside the walls of the classroom and what's going on in the world. So I would, I would encourage you not to stress about the nitty gritty of the FOSS investigations and to um, give the students a little bit more autonomy and freedom with the way that they choose to design their investigations instead of just really um, following that FOSS guide word for word. Because what's really important here in the hands-on is not that they do the procedure perfectly as it says in the FOSS guide, but how are they using those materials that are provided to actually deepen their understanding of something that's gonna help them solve the problem of protecting the Western pond turtle. So that should remain um, as the focus. And again, um, with the PBL structure and philosophy of this unit, we're gonna have to kind of loosen the way that we've traditionally taught science investigations by giving them a little bit more freedom to choose what they wanna test and how they wanna test it. So um, I will share a little bit more of that with you um, as we walk through this lesson. So we start this lesson by having students look again at their scientific models and to think about if they've included stuff that the Western pond turtle actually needs to survive. So are there plants in there? Are there animals that the Western pond turtle eats? 
in their model or are there not? So we're having them kind of look again at this model. And then here we have another career connection or career spotlight of uh, ecologist. So, I mean, obviously this unit is really um, an ecology based unit. So um, it would be unnatural not to share with them that they are actually doing what ecologists do in the real world. They're studying ecosystem by studying the different interactions between organisms in that ecosystem and also between organisms and the non-living parts of that ecosystem. So please remind them that they're actually doing work that real scientists do in the real world. So we're continuing to scaffold student thinking and help them to think about how organisms within that ecosystem are connected. So we're really starting to ask questions like plants or animals, like have you put any plants or animals in your model? And then if they put other animals in their model, animals that the western pond turtle might eat, what does that animal eat? So we're having them actually think about the food chain and start to develop an understanding of energy being transferred from organism to organism within an ecosystem. And then we actually present them with the food chain. So it's really important for students to actually be looking at uh, food chains and food webs starting fifth grade or even earlier. So we actually in our third grade unit introduced the idea. Um, and so this should be something that's familiar to them. So elicit some um, student ideas about this. And we're providing them with a definition of food chain. The arrows of the food chain are actually super important. And when I used to teach uh, high school biology, students had a lot of misconceptions about what the arrows represented. And kind of the first thing that they'd always tell me is, well, the arrows are the wrong way. And I'd ask them, okay, why? Why are the arrows the wrong way? Because if you look at the arrows right now, it's pointing from like the leaf to the caterpillar, caterpillar to the chameleon, chameleon to snake and snake to mongoose. So they would tell me that it should be a, the other way around because the mongoose eats the snake, the snake eats the chameleon, the chameleon eats the caterpillar, and the caterpillar eats the leaf. So um, to some students, this may be kind of counterintuitive, but this is the actual way that the arrows are supposed to be in a food web or in a food chain. We're not showing necessarily only that one animal eats the other, but we're showing the transfer of energy. So it's important in fifth grade for them to start thinking about energy and energy transfer between organism to organism. So we could rephrase this in a way where we say, well, the mongoose gets energy from the snake. The leaf gives energy to the caterpillar. The caterpillar gives energy to the chameleon. The chameleon gives energy to the snake. So the energy is being um, given or taken um, because of one organism eating another for energy. So I would definitely pause and have students think about this. And again, here's where the misconceptions, you know, start to develop. So I would really, you know, ask them, why don't they point in the other direction? Why would that not really make sense if we're talking about energy? So I think it's important to bring up the idea of energy at this point. And then again, uh, same way, arrows showing the transfer of energy, but this is not so linear, right? This is a food web. So there's a lot of relationships here between organisms. I would definitely give them a couple minutes to talk this through with a partner. So similar definition as food chain, but just expanded. So we're going to have students actually take this idea of using arrows to show the transfer of energy and apply it to the scientific model that they were working on. So we asked them if they can use arrows to show how energy is moving from one organism to another in the food chain, or in if they had more of a web-like situation in their model than the food web. Can you add some arrows to show how energy is moving through your model and getting to the western pond turtle? In these next two sessions, students will plan their investigation and then conduct their investigation. So lesson two, session two, will focus on planning the investigation. 
and uh, session three will focus on actually setting up the investigation and then um, conducting or planning observations that follow. So we start by having students look again at their model and to pinpoint um, any producers that might actually be in their model. And then this is kind of tying back to the storyline, tying back to the idea of the Western pond turtle and to see what the Western pond turtle actually needs to survive. We have another career connection, a career spotlight of a botanist. So botanist is a scientist who studies plants and literally what students are going to be doing in the next few sessions is studying what plants need in order to grow and thrive. So in the next series of slides, you're going to see a progression of questions and prompts where students are planning their investigation. So um, we're going to just have them think about the different factors that they want to control and the different conditions that they want to put their test subjects through in order to understand what plants actually need in order to grow. So the test subjects are little baby seedlings that they're going to be sprouting and then they're going to have the opportunity to actually place these seedlings in different parts of the classroom, water them with different amounts of water. So they're controlling factors such as light and water and just general location. So um, you can take a look at the next few slides. If you've been following along in our unit guide, we're currently on page 16. And now we're at the point where students are going to actually articulate their plan to investigate. So there's an investigation plan thinking map that's located in our unit plan after page 16. And students are going to use that as kind of like a template to plan their investigation. And then students will also be sharing their investigation plan with another team. So we're trying to build a sense of community where students are researching, investigating, and then um, sharing their data and their conclusions with the rest of their peers. So now we're at session three, where students are actually planting their seedlings and placing them in the designated area that they had planned in their investigation plan. So this is where I think it's okay to give them some directions on how to plant their seedlings. So here's a, a version of simple instructions to plant the seeds. And then in the investigation plan guide, the thinking map, there are a couple of pages at the end there where there is a table for students to actually collect data and draw and write their observations down every few days. So depending on how often you are with your students and how often you have time to have them take a look, you can actually space that out accordingly and have them have a place to actually collect their data. I would um, recommend that you use this guide versus the um, tables that are provided in the FOSS investigation itself because these line up way better with the actual storyline. So session four is another investigation where students are looking at seedlings again and trying to figure out is soil something that plants need to grow? And this is actually on page 18 of the unit guide if you're following along. Most students have the misconception that soil is something that plants need in order to grow, which is not actually true. So um, we are trying to get them to figure that out on their own by attempting to grow wheat seeds or wheat seedlings in a straw 
just with a wick of paper towel and water. So students will make a prediction about what will happen with their wheat seed in the straw. Some may think that it might not grow and then some might have actually tried this before. So there's an investigation log that they can use to make their predictions about what's going to happen. Here are some simplified steps to follow for creating these little straws with the wheat growing inside them. You can use some of your FOSS materials from your FOSS kit for this. You should have everything you need. Now, um, the way that the FOSS has outlined this, they provide a little graduated cylinder for you to actually put the straws in to hold them up. And then you use a syringe to actually keep squirting water into the cylinder to keep the seeds moist. So it's slightly different than just using a glass So this is what the seeds would look like in about five to seven days. They're actually sprouting without soil. So this is session five of lesson two. And in this session, students are going to be creating an argument based on evidence for what plants actually need in order to thrive. I think it's a super important lesson or super important session. Um, I taught science for many years, and one of the problems with my own teaching was that we spent a whole lot of time in the actual hands-on part of experiments and labs, but not enough time actually making sense of all the data that we had collected. So it's really important that students see that the data and observations that they're collecting have really important a lot of importance and value when it comes to actually uh, gaining a deeper understanding of things. So this lesson guides them through constructing an argument based on evidence for what plants actually need in order to thrive and grow. So we're reminding students about the question that we were answering and also bringing uh, to their attention this word evidence. Evidence are the observations that we've made which actually help us to answer our question. So the difference between data and evidence would be data is information that you've collected. Evidence is when you're actually trying to use that information to support a claim, a scientific claim. The next few slides guide students through some questions to think about the data that they collected in their two experiments. So you can choose your preferred protocol to have discussions about this. It might be helpful to have them work in teams first to kind of come up with the answers to this and then to talk together as a group for each experiment. This My Scientific Argument Thinking Template is provided as a place to help students write down their ideas and to really articulate their claim. So there's that scientific claim box at the top after the question box, plants need, and then a space for students to write what they found plants actually need in order to thrive. And then there are four boxes for evidence that students found from their investigations so they can draw or write or write and draw to help support their scientific claim that they're trying to make. So this is the beginning of scientific argumentation, which is a really key skill that is needed in later science and also just a really important English language arts literacy skill. So we're doing, again, overlap between high quality STEM and meaningful ELA integration. I think it's important to be able to give students a chance to share their thinking and their hard work with others. So in this part of the session, students work in teams to create one or two slides to share their scientific argument and then to present that to the class.
Here's a template you can give them so they don't have to create things from scratch. They can use this to just fill in the, the text and be ready to present. Hopefully, students found that water was really important in order for the seedlings to grow and survive. Also, I'm hoping they found that sunlight to some degree was also important in helping them grow into healthy adult plants. The thing is that a lot of seeds can actually sprout without sunlight, and then a lot of plants can actually also grow with very limited light, but they don't usually grow well. And the thing is, once they, once they reach adulthood, um, if they're not given the right amount of sunlight, they actually aren't going to produce fruit or beans or whatever type of um, plant you're dealing with. So I'm hoping that they have developed the understanding that light to some degree is necessary and so is water. Um, the standards at fifth grade don't talk much about carbon dioxide yet, but that's something you can present to them if you choose to, because carbon dioxide is also an important uh, necessity of plants in order for survival and growth. Um, another thing that I wanted to just share is that oftentimes when we're growing seedlings in light versus dark, uh, the dark ones do sometimes grow, but they develop a different color. So an unhealthy, sometimes like pale yellowish color. So that's also an indicator that your plant's not thriving so well. So be prepared to have some conversations if the investigation doesn't go as you had planned as a teacher. Um, it's always good to validate students actual ob observations instead of telling them that their experiment was flawed. So um, important to have those follow-up discussions if you need. And then based on how much you want to expand on this, you can talk about carbon dioxide or you can leave that for a little bit later. We are now on session six in lesson two. And in this session, students will just revisit their models and make revisions and optimize those. So we are just reconnecting with the storyline, reconnecting with the driving question, and not forgetting about our Western pond turtle. And so students will continue to add to their models. And they have probably learned a thing or two about what the producers in their ecosystem actually need in order to survive and thrive. So give them the space and time right now to add to their model and make it kind of like a more complete representation of a true ecosystem. The sun is a really, really important part of any ecosystem on the earth. And that is definitely something that students should be including in their model. We can ask them if they have or if they have not. But energy from the sun is very important in fueling the producers, which then are eaten by different animals in the ecosystem of the Western pond turtle. And um, in our NGSS standards for fifth grade life science, uh, students are expected to be able to explain how energy from the sun actually uh, fuels the entire ecosystem. So it's important that the sun is uh, represented in that model and students should be able to explain the importance of the sun in the ecosystem. Session seven is another field or outdoor STEM activity where students go outside and look at the different living and non-living things in their ecosystem. And in this specific outdoor STEM activity, students are building a food web for the ecosystem that they're observing. So we're adding a little bit more complexity to this field STEM activity versus the last one. So here, students are being asked to draw a couple of animals, plants, other non-living things that are in the ecosystem, and then to label them and to show arrows depicting the transfer of energy through the ecosystem. So um, again, sun would be an important thing to ask them about. We really want our students to understand that the energy in the ecosystem ultimately comes from the sun. 
In this lesson, students will expand their understanding of the western pond turtle and its role in its ecosystem by learning about the predators that eat the western pond turtle and the impact of invasive species on the western pond turtle's survival. We're asking students to look again at their models and to think if they included any predators that eat the western pond turtle or other animals that maybe compete with the western pond turtle by eating what the Western prawn turtle also eats. Here's a video about predators and competitors. You can go ahead and watch it and see if it's something that you might want to use. So after you've talked about the difference between a predator and a competitor with your students, I have this fun activity for you. It's the predator or competitor class jigsaw. So students are pretty much working in teams to research a specific predator or competitor that affects the western pond turtle's survival. And they have to read about this organism and think about whether it's a predator and competitor, predator or competitor and why and then they present their findings to the class. So here's the task that students are going to be asked to do in their teams. I like to give them checklists that keep them on track. and then they are going to present their findings. I like to assign a communications manager to actually refine the messaging of the team and be ready to present it to the audience. I don't like to call it reporter because I feel like reporter is more of a passive role where students just simply parrot what the team told them to say. But a communications manager has to really intentionally think about the messaging of the team and to help the team in refining what they want to share with the rest of the group and then to finally deliver that message on behalf of the team. So here are the predator or competitor informational cards. You should actually have large printouts of these in your kit in your STEM kit. So we've printed these out for you and laminated them and there should be two sets of these for you to share with your students. You also have them in slides version if you'd rather just have students look at them through the slides. So after students present their predator and competitor jigsaw team seminars, they're going to revisit their models and see if they can add any predators or competitors to their model um, if they feel like they're an important part of that ecosystem. Are they important? Um, are they an important facet of um, understanding in order to help protect or preserve the western pond turtle. So most likely your students will be excited about adding predators or competitors to their models. In this lesson, which starts on page 27 of the unit guide, students will expand their understanding of ecosystems by investigating the role of decomposers in the recycling of matter within that ecosystem. Students will then apply their understanding of the importance of decomposers to the ecosystem habitat of the western pond turtle. We want to get students thinking about the importance of decomposers in an ecosystem, and unfortunately we don't have critters in this kit anymore, which means that you don't actually have real worms to work with. So um, I found this time lapse video of worms actually decomposing some compost. Um, have students think about things that they notice and things that they wonder about these worms um, busy with this compost. So go ahead and pause the video and take a look at this uh, video that I've shared with you. So that was a pretty interesting video for you, I hope. 
um, we would ask students now to make sense of what they observed. So to talk to their team and then to draw a simple model of what they think is happening in that compost bin. So students can use words and pictures to explain their thinking. And I would just give them a plain piece of paper, just regular size piece of paper to draw their thoughts. Session two of lesson four continues on the idea of decomposers and in this session, you will actually conduct an experiment where you're studying how different pieces of food decompose. So for this session, you're actually going to have to collect some scraps of food that students are going to be able to observe as they decay. So um, one way you can actually have students observe that is by putting pieces of food in plastic baggies and sealing them up so they can kind of take a look and pass that around and it's a safe contained space. Another way you can actually have them observe is by using small plastic cups and covering them up with sarin wrap and then having um, the piece of food inside. You can also choose what kind of foods you want to put in there. So um, I would recommend maybe some different types of fruit chunks, um, maybe a cup of yogurt, piece of bread, already said piece of fruit, any other food really that you think will show some, some signs of decay. Um, I would steer away from peels like fruit peels because those tend to dry up instead of decaying. Here's an observation sheet where students can make a prediction about what's going to happen to their piece of food and then take detailed observations every day and to see is there something else besides worms because we don't have worms this time. Um, is there something else that they see that's actually breaking apart that food. So we're hoping that they'll see some type of mold, which is a microorganism that's a decomposer. So not worms exactly, but still a decomposer that's really important and that breaks down um, dead plant matter and turns it into something else. So we're having students think about the scrap of food and how it changed and how those decomposers that they hopefully saw were working hard to break that matter down into something else that could be used. So in this case, we're not you know, the, the scraps of food aren't actually located in nature, they're an isolated system. But if you were to put that scrap of food into a compost bin or even into a garden, what would happen to it over the span of weeks? So that's something you can actually have them investigate further if they have some of these questions. So we'll have students start to think about decay and decomposers and what they actually do in the ecosystem. So, so far they've seen several different decomposers in action and the next session is actually going to really define that experience for them. The important thing is that we've shown them some pretty concrete uh, examples of de decomposition in action before we're actually giving them the definition. So um, research shows that students tend to learn things and remember things better when they actually have that concrete experience before they're exposed to the vocabulary. So um, just a way to kind of flip the way that we traditionally teach um, instead of presenting the vocab and kind of front loading those concepts first, it's a lot easier for them to actually remember some of these things after they've actually seen it in action. Session three will be a lesson where students go more deeply into the idea of what it means for a decomposer to actually decompose something and decay something. And they also use some texts to research different decomposers that live in the freshwater ecosystem of the Western pond turtle. We're actually currently on page 29. I'm sorry if I haven't been keeping up with giving you page numbers for our unit guide. So students will actually read a National Geographic entry on decomposers. They're going to work in teams to talk through the information in the article, and then they're verbally going to ask, answer these questions.
Students will now think about the Western pond turtles ecosystem and the different decomposers that live in that specific ecosystem. And um, they're going to think about why they're actually important for them. So previously we had them learn about decomposers. What do decomposers do? And now we're having them apply that information into the context of the storyline and the, the context of the driving question. Um, so how are decomposers actually playing an important role in the ecosystem of a Western palm turtle? We have a couple of articles that have details specifically about decomposers that live in a freshwater ecosystem. So this would be a good starting point to have students research about the different decomposers that live in that ecosystem. And I think the next slide talks about um, having them look at the model again, having them look at their model of the Western pond turtle and its ecosystem and adding decomposers into that model. So as you can see, students have at this point really developed a pretty solid model showing the Western pond turtle and all of the non-living and living things that play an important role to make that ecosystem function well. The students will refine their models of the Western pond turtle in its ecosystem and add decomposers to that ecosystem. The last session in this lesson, which is on page 30, is an optional extension where you can use the FOSS investigation on yeast to further discuss or learn about decomposers. Because as you may know, yeast are, they're a kind of microorganism that's a decomposer in its ecosystem. So that's something you can choose to extend on. However, um, we just made that optional because it is a little bit of a stretch. And also at this point, if you're running low on time, you really want the students to have a lot of time in the final lesson, lesson five, where they're actually going to be creating a public product to share what they've learned and how they've solved the driving question. Um, they're gonna share that with their community. So I would probably encourage you to skip that and to move on to Lesson five. This is the culminating lesson in our STEM storyline. It's located on page 32. So in this lesson, students create a public product that will be shared in their community. And it's going to be sharing actionable steps that can be taken to help save the Western pond turtle. Because this is a unit created in the framework of project-based learning, there is a whole lot of opportunity to give students autonomy about how they'd like to actually present their message. So based on your comfort level with certain options and the time that you have available to dedicate to this project, you can select an option that fits your needs and the needs of your students and the wishes of your students. Um, below in the next slide, we have some ideas about how you can work with students to create a public product that could be shared with others. So this is a really exciting, culminating experience in this unit. So here are some options to think about how you might want to help students create a public product that's impactful in their community. So a video can be one way the class can work together upload to YouTube and create an educational piece that could be shared with the community. If more than one class in your building is working on this project, there's a way you can collaborate with other teachers to create a chunk of a video that can then be shared with the world. By the way, if you do that, please, please, please do share with me. I'd love to see what your students produce and to share it out with a larger audience for you. Um, also, there's a possibility that you can't scale up like that and that you're gonna have students actually just create separate public awareness materials. Students could do something like posters, videos, podcasts, website, um, some other more tangible thing that would be easier for you to facilitate um, and support them in producing. So this is something where each team could work on something different based on what they're interested in. And you can host a STEM seminar night, similar to a STEM fair, but different because it's so targeted about the specific phenomenon of the Western pond turtle. And in this space, families, teachers, and community members can come and learn from students about the Western pond turtle. And that's a, just a really, it could be a really great space for students to share their learning throughout the unit. Another way we thought of 
possibly having students share this out is to write or have them write a letter or some type of a presentation um, to create some type of a presentation um, with questions or suggestions for a specific audience who's already focusing on preservation efforts or an audience that they think should be focusing on preservation efforts. So the Woodland Park Zoo, they're actually leading preservation efforts in the state. They have a sanctuary for the Western Pond Turtles. They might be an interesting um, group to for the students to reach out to. Um, there's other local and state agencies that work to preserve spaces for endangered species. So if your students wanted to partner up with one of those, that's also a really cool option. And um, here at ESD 112, we're here to support you in making those connections if that's something you'd be wanting to pursue. So please feel free to reach out to myself or to anybody else on our STEM initiatives team. We have that link in there um, in our unit if you need help with connecting to someone in your community. So there's a whole lot of options of what you can do for this culminating um, product for students. And ultimately, um, I would ask that you be in tune with your students and um, listen to what they would like to do. And also give yourself some of that space to choose something that you feel comfortable in supporting the students with as well. So the way we've suggested that you approach this final product is to have students break up into expert groups. So here are some different topics where I've actually written some articles for students to use to deepen their understanding of and research specific topics. So here are some ideas for different topics that can be turned into expert groups and students would break up into groups and really focus on their specific topic that interests them. So here is a place where I would introduce, here's some, some things you can really dive deeper into. What are you interested in? How are you interested in actually helping the Western Pond Turtle? Students will work in their teams to focus on the specific area that they wanted to become experts on. And if you look at page 33 of the unit guide, you'll see that there's a link to different articles that can be uh, used to deepen that understanding. So the articles correlate with the topics that I had just shown you. And these are three questions for students to really focus on as they read that information. Students will share what they learn with the class. So in doing so, they're practicing presenting. If that's gonna be something they have to do later, which is likely, then we're just setting them up for success. In this field STEM activity, which is lesson five, session two, students will be going outside and will be looking for signs of human impact on their local ecosystem. So anywhere close to the play yard, anywhere, actually anywhere you can take them um, on campus, they're going to see impacts of, of human activity there. So we're just trying to get students to um, look in their local environment, see the ways that we might have disrupted or changed the local ecosystem. Later in the lesson, students will be really trying to hone in on how the Western Pond Turtles have been affected by different um, human related activities. In their expert groups, this is something they might have already been reading about, how humans have impacted the Western Pond Turtle. Lesson three, students look more closely at the problem that they're trying to solve. They look more closely at the solution that they had planned and they work with another team to get feedback and refine their solution. So in this session, students are gonna work together to give each other feedback on the actual doability of their solutions. So for example, roads are a problem that have caused a lot of Western pond turtle deaths. So is a realistic solution to stop building roads or to no longer use the roads that are currently there? No, that's not really a doable solution. So this um, session is intended to actually help students think about and really refine and optimize the solution that they're going to be actually presenting to a public audience. So, you know, 
The great thing about PBL is that there's so many opportunities for students to actually refine and reflect and refine and reflect and refine and reflect to the point where if you're at the end of the project and if you have a student who is not actually performing well, you know, I would say it's really not on that student. There were so many opportunities for reflection or should have been opportunities for re reflection and refinement that didn't happen for that student to not, su not succeed. So um, at this point, um, each student should start to feel definitely some forms of success in their work and should start to really see some of the fruits of all their hard work and should really start to refine what they're going to be presenting to an audience outside the walls of the classroom. are nearing the end of our unit and the exciting exciting part of this unit is now the project building sessions so here is where students are actually working on creating that final product and i've broken it down for you into different sessions so this can be four or more sessions depending on how much time your students actually need so that is something that you would have to really uh, monitor and decide for yourself but I will just guide you through a couple of sessions that I think are going to be really important in helping students develop something that's really coherent and really meaningful and really impactful. So we don't want like the traditional trifold um, science STEM fair poster board that students are really detached from and that doesn't actually have a, a really powerful impact in the community or in the with the audience we want the students to be producing something that's going to be received well by the audience that it's intended for even though this session seems like a recap it's the information deep dive it's actually really important and it will serve as a formative assessment checkpoint for you to see if students are actually having the content mastered that they need to in order to be successful in producing something that will have a good impact in their community. So it seems like it's a redundant, but I think it's an important step to move them towards success in the project. And um, during all of these project building sessions, it's really important for you to serve as a coach for them to uh, circulate the classroom and to check in with teams individually to make sure that they have the right amount of information that they need in order to be successful. So where are they being held up? Where are they stuck? What are they confused about? Where do they need more information? So be the coach for them during this process. Here's another checklist for a project building session. So here students are planning the product. So who's your audience? How are they actually going to share their message with the audience? How are they going to convince the audience to make a change? And then who will do what? So are they building um, a website and who's gonna do what as a part of building the website? Are they creating a video? If so, who is responsible for which um, job on their, on their team? What materials are they going to need? And how realistic is their plan considering how much time they actually have to prepare? So if they have a couple of days to prepare, Mm, I think maybe building a very comprehensive website might be a little bit ambitious, but if this is something you're able to actually give them more time on, then that is an appropriate goal. So this is something, again, that you want to be coaching your students um, along with as they are working on planning for their product. And this is also something where you can be that person to also help them with creating realistic plans um, that align well with the timeline and with the audience that they're trying to appeal to. Um, this is also a great place for you to coach them on team roles and distributing roles and, and responsibilities evenly. Um, I will be linking some resources on team roles into the notes of this specific slide that you can check out. So this is one of the most exciting project building sessions probably, and this might be more than one session, probably will be more than one session. 
this is where students are actually creating their public awareness materials. So I would give them several sessions to just work on their materials. And then here's a checklist for them to look at. Um, as a coach during this time, it's very important for you as a teacher to circulate and to see um, how are their final products looking? Are they seeming like they'll be on time, on schedule, or did they uh, have a plan that was too ambitious? Do they need help with restructuring that plan to be more reasonable? Um, what do their materials actually look like? Are they going to be embarrassed when they present their public product to a, an audience outside the classroom? So here is where um, it's another checkpoint for you to make sure that you're setting them up for success. And one thing I would suggest is to have consultants from other teams um, come and help out a team if um, you feel that there's some concerns that you may have. So we're trying to avoid the situation where students are creating um, just low quality material. So we're lifting the bar on expectations, but also providing a lot of coaching and time and support for them to actually create something that's impactful and something that they're proud of. Here's an opportunity for students to practice with their peers and to, um, if they have a video, it'd be more of like a video showing if they're actually going to be giving a small talk, um, then that would be something they can practice. Are their materials easy to understand? Are they being clear? Are they being engaging visually or auditorily? So we want students to really um, present something that is powerful and persuasive. And uh, the way to do that is not to just uh, stare down at some flashcards and have PowerPoints that have a whole lot of text on them. So that's something that ideally should have been addressed earlier when the students were planning for their product. But here's also a place where there is time to make um, revisions. So as you can see, these project building sessions can actually end up taking a span of a couple of weeks um, if you're able to dedicate that much time to them. The launch is gonna be the amazing day where students have a chance to share all their hard work with um, their community, with a public audience, with someone outside the walls of the classroom. So it's a really exciting time. And you can choose to actually um, have students present in a variety of different formats. Here are a couple of ideas that I had. So putting on a STEM fair is always a cool thing. So each team can set up their materials and an audience will circulate and visit each exhibit. So multiple classes can actually contribute to the fair. Um, another uh, way to share this information out is to have a movie screening if there are um, if your class worked on uh, creating a video or if multiple classes worked on creating videos. So that's another kind of fun um, way to share or have students share. And we have a document in um, linked through the unit guide that we will continue to upload ideas on as people come up with new ideas on how to share student work out. I'm hoping that the STEM fair or whatever format you choose to have students present their public products in at the end is going to be a super exciting and proud moment for you and your students. And I hope you remind them how awesome they are and how proud you are of them and all the hard work they did. So um, it'd be helpful to have that driving question up during the STEM fair uh, to congratulate your students in front of the community and then to just show a whole lot of pride and um, gratitude towards your students for their hard work on the topic. So that's about it. We have walked through our entire unit called Save Our Turtles for Fifth Grade Life Science um, to accompany the Living Systems Kit. I hope that you benefited from this walkthrough of the unit. I hope that's a little bit more familiar to you. I hope that you're excited to try teaching either all or parts of this with your students. And I hope that you'll stay in touch with any questions, thoughts, and concerns you have, along with please looping me in when there are pieces of student work that you're able to share with me or other stories or anecdotes that you're able to share with me. Um, I'm always here at ESD 112 to talk to you and to support you if you should need any anything. So please reach out to me. My email is on this slide. Um, thank you so much for joining me and I hope you I hope you enjoyed this web training.